So let's begin reading here together in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 11. I'll read verses 11 to 14, and then we'll get into our, into our studies. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Paul writes, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. Or if we are of a sound mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. Now what an appropriate message for this season as well as an appropriate message for our nation and for our world. We just celebrated Easter, a time that we celebrate Jesus' victory over the grave. And we preach a message. We pre preach the message that Jesus Christ laid down his life for people. We share how sin entered into the world through one man. Sin entered into the world through, through Adam, when you look in the book of Romans in chapter 5, verse 12, Paul said it like this. Paul said, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all men because all sinned. So Paul, as he was quoting that, actually has taken the Genesis account of the fall of man literally. He didn't say sin originated with man. He said sin entered in through men. Sin didn't originate in men. It actually originates with Satan. In 1 John 3, verse 8, John tells us that the devil sinned from the beginning. The devil sinned from the point of his rebellion. Satan is the originator and he's the initiator of sin. It is by sin, the sin of pride, that Satan fell from his position as covering cherub. And as you read your Bible, you see that after he fell, he influenced other angels, and these other angels also rebelled against God. When you look in Revelation 12, verse 9, um, John wrote, the great dragon was cast out, the great dragon being Satan, that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So when Satan fell, Satan entered into the garden, the Garden of Eden. Even as he had fallen by pride, he tempted Eve through pride to disobey God. In Genesis 3, 4 through 6, it says, The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, while well, she took of its fruit and ate, she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Eve took of the forbidden fruit first, but the sin was charged against Adam. That's because he had been given the command directly by God. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that ye eat of it ye shall surely die. And so, through his disobedience, sin made its entrance into the world. That's what Paul had said. Sin entered into the world. But he didn't say sins. He said sin. That speaks of his nature. It speaks of his inherent propensity to unrighteousness. Adam, in other words, now had a fallen nature, a sin nature, and it's his nature that he passes on to his children. Romans 5, 12 again, death spread to all men because all sinned. His descendants received their physical properties from him as well as in nature. And the nature, when you study your Bible, theologians have sp stated it like this, the nature is called Adamic. It's a sin nature. It's also spoken of as the old man or the fallen nature. In Psalm 51, verse 5, 
David said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And when Paul was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 3, he said, We were by nature children of wrath. We are instinctively by nature children of wrath. Now remember, God had told him that in the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit, he would surely die. So spiritually, he was immediately cut off from God. Eventually, he physically died. Some of the saddest words you're going to find in Scripture are found in the book of Genesis, chapter 5, verse 5. Because it says simply, So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Some of the saddest words that you'll read in the Bible, and he died. Incidentally, this also answers the question concerning evil. Why does evil exist? And the answer in a most simple form would be it exists because choices were made to disobey God and evil is the result. Evil is the consequence of man's decision, not the design of God. And the Bible makes it very clear that man is sinful by nature. In Ecclesiastes 7.20, there is not a just man on earth who does good and doesn't sin. Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, man is completely sinful, totally sinful. He doesn't do good. By nature, he does evil. And ultimately, man is going to pay a price for that, the wages of sin. The wages of sin he receives is death, and ultimately, he pays a price through judgment. But God has done something about it, because when it says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, Paul went on to say, but the free gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Even though we are sinners by nature, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Even though we are sinners by nature, God didn't leave us in that condition. Guys, never forget that. He sent his son Christ to die on the cross for us. You see, the soul that sinneth shall die. And the Bible tells us in, in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. And so standing before God, Receiving judgment is something that every human being will do. Every human being stands before God. And Paul had been saying that. Now look at verse 10 for a moment in chapter 5. He said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. When he says we must all appear, the word appear means to be openly and publicly revealed in the full and true reality of one's character. We're going to be completely manifest or open in a public way. And it's something that is seen. In Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So, God sees it all, and we are to appear before him. We will appear. It'll be seen clearly. All humanity stands before the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in the Gospel of John, in chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus said, that God had given him authority to execute judgment also because he's the son of man. In Acts 17, verse 31, later Paul said that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man, speaking of Jesus, by the man whom he has ordained. And so man stands before God. Jesus is the judge. And many will receive judgment for rejecting Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation. Jesus is the judge, and the gospel is the standard of judgment. In John 12, 48, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words, Jesus said. That very word which I spoke, 
will condemn him at the last day. And so rejecting Jesus' invitation to come to him has eternal consequences. There are people who have rejected him. There are people right now, perhaps, who are even watching online. And you've heard the message. You have friends who have invited you. They have, they have shared and said, you ought to come online, go to church with us, and you're doing it right now. I keep receiving reports that that's taking place, and for that I'm very grateful. You, you wouldn't go to a church service normally, but here you are with us, listening to the Word. But you haven't given your heart to Christ yet. You haven't said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. There are many people who, who will listen but don't respond but today is your opportunity. Today is your opportunity to open your heart to Christ and say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Because he's giving you an invitation. He's, he's speaking his word to you through the word of God, the Bible. And if you accept, you can be born again. But if you reject, there are consequences that are eternal. Now, those of us who have been saved, we've been saved by the grace of God through faith. But being saved by grace doesn't remove the responsibility of living right before God. If we are saved, the way that we live reveals a new nature because it's referred to in Scripture as a new life. And we live a life that produces what are called good works. We don't do the good works to be saved. We do good works because we are saved. And James chapter 2, verse 26 says it like this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So when we got saved, our life was changed, and we began to do works, works that God rewards. You see, for believers, appearing before the judgment seat is to receive a reward, not judgment. For us as believers, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed us of all of our sins, and, and judgment is dealt with. In Romans 5, 9, we have been justified by his blood. And Paul says, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we believers will stand before the Lord. And Paul had just spoken of that in verse 10. But we are not standing before him to receive judgment. We receive eternal reward. This seat that he's speaking about is called the, the Bema seat. It was a place of rewards. It's, it's a place where every work comes into judgment for a reward. Paul speaks of it in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15, when he says, No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Every time I read that scripture, I remember cartoons that I used to watch as a kid I always remember Wiley Coyote. I don't know how many of you guys remember Wiley Coyote. He was always going after the Roadrunner. And you'd see him sometimes. I forget what it was, Ajax or something, bombs. I forget what it is. But he was always trying to blow up the Roadrunner, and then he did. it would explode, and you'd see him just standing there smoking. And that's how some people are going to enter into the kingdom of God. They're going to be smoking. They may be able to go in, but they're going to be smoking because their lives have not really produced the kind of fruit that God would have intended for them. And God does intend to give us reward. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, Paul said it like this. He said, you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does. So you're going to receive a reward. And I pray that each one of us receive a reward that is great because the works that we did for him were great. You see, the Christian loves God, and the Christian loves other people. And the Christian lives a life of good works, not to be saved because they are saved. Remember that love for God and others always provokes us to do good. 
In Titus 2.14, Paul said, Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, listen, zealous for good works. And it is these good works that result in receiving reward from God. Believers receive rewards, but unbelievers eternal judgment. Romans 14, 12 says, each of us shall give account of himself to God. And that leads us to verse 11, because that is why Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. When he says the terror, the word terror speaks of a deep reverential awe of God. An awe of God that is produced because we have seen that he is holy. It's a fear of the Lord that Paul knew well that drove him to persuade men. It is what causes a man to turn away from sin and turn to God. In Job 28, verse 28, we read, To man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. In Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. So God by nature is holy. Man by nature is evil. And because this is true, judgment awaits evil man. So that should provoke us. It should provoke us to service to the Lord. It also should produce in us a deep seriousness of mind. Because you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Those are the only two places. I was talking to my wife, Marie, earlier, I think this morning. And I was just re remembering when our church had just begun, we hadn't been meeting as a fellowship more than just a few months. And we used to rent a place in, um, in Ontario small church that's had 120 people. Our church at that time had about 45 to 50, maybe 60 people at the most. We had a small fellowship. And, uh, and I gave a study after, uh, 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 and after the study, uh, I, I, a guy walks up to me. At that time, I was, I was probably, uh, I was 31 years old. And um, a guy walks up to me after the study, and he introduces himself to me, and he says, my name is so-and-so, and I was the assistant pastor of a certain Calvary chapel. And so I shook his hand, and I said, it's nice to meet you. And he says, I enjoyed your Bible study. And I said, well, that's nice, good. He says, but you're so serious. And when he looked at me and said, but you're so serious, I still remember looking at him and kind of furrowing my eyebrows and saying, the gospel is serious. I think sometimes when we go to church, we're expecting to be entertained. Uh, are you smiling if you tell somebody, get out of the way, that car's going to run you over? Is that a time to laugh and to joke? I, I think that when you, when you bring the gospel and share the gospel, of course, during a study like this, you know, I, I, I think that a pastor's personality should be free. And, and for me, I have to be honest with you, I'm used to a group of people that I can laugh with, and, and it bothers me that I'm not able to kind of tease with the church. It bothers me a lot that I'm not able to do so. Even if I say something that I think is funny, you guys just sit there quietly, and it is like unnerving. Even right now, look at you. And as I, so it's, it's awkward. It's awkward for me. But the bottom line is, and I always remember this, the gospel is very serious because it's talking about heaven and it's talking about hell. Church services are not entertainment services. You know, the pastor is not, is not a clown who's there to, to perform tricks for people who want to be entertained. The gospel is serious because it's a message that speaks of heaven and it speaks of the penalty of rejecting the gospel, which is hell. That's a very serious message. It isn't something to be playing with, and it's certainly not the platform for somebody to allow their personality to shine to the eclipsing of the word of God. And so it's very important. And, and, and knowing that, 
even though you enjoy laughing, and I enjoy a good laugh, and I enjoy joking and all of those things, and certainly don't want to come off as if, if I don't, my wife will tell you that I love to tease her, I love to mess around with her. I, I love to laugh with people. Why wouldn't we? But at the same time, man, when you're talking about the Lord, when you're giving a Bible study, when you're speaking concerning the things that are eternal, those things ought to weigh heavily on you. They ought to. And those who are being spoken to ought to know there's a soberness and a seriousness about this message. Why? Because to receive Christ is to have life. To reject him is to stand in judgment. In Hebrews 12, 29, the writer says, Our God is a consuming fire. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I had a guy I knew, he was married to a friend of my wife Marie's. And his wife used to come here when our church was a year old or less. She would come to our church and she started bringing her husband whom Marie knew. And uh, one day after church, he wasn't a believer, one day after a church service, and he would come off and on. One day after the church service, he walked up to me and we're talking, and I had gotten to know him by name. And he looks at me, and I'll never forget this, as he, with a straight face, said this to me. He said, yeah, I'm going to go to hell. And I'll never forget that nonchalant kind of way he spoke. He goes, yeah, I'm going to go to hell, but that's okay. All my friends are going too, and we're going to party. Jesus said, no. Jesus said, if you're going to fear, fear the one who can not only kill you, but judges you. Fear him. So hell isn't a place of partying. Hell is the absence of God, a place of torment that never ends. And that's why we preach a message that is designed by God to draw people out of hell. You see, to serve the Lord faithfully and to encourage people to salvation is what draws us. Notice how he said again in verse 11, the terror of the Lord Knowing it, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. To reject Jesus is to accept eternal judgment. And judgment isn't annihilation. Judgment is a constant state of torment. It's an eternity of regret. And this knowledge drove Paul to preach the gospel. And he did it with integrity. He did it with love. He did it with a pure heart. He said in verse 11, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. In other words, God knows what we are, and God knows how we have behaved ourselves. And I trust that you have also seen our manner of life and know what I am saying to you is true. Verse 12, we do not commend ourselves again to you but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. You see, adversaries in the Corinthian church were probably going to twist his words once again, and by twisting the things that he's saying would cause division within the church. You see, no matter what he said, there would be someone who would question it. No matter if he said it was black, somebody would say it's white. If he said it is sweet, somebody's going to say it's sour. If he says that I do this because I love you, they will say, no, he does this because he wants to dominate you. That's what's taking place. And there were people who were undermining. They would take his words, twist them, and then use them to cause division. In the Old Testament book of Proverbs, in chapter 26, verse 20, the writer said, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. They would stoke the fire. They would increase the gossip. But he was saying, no, I'm not doing anything. And thus, you know my heart, you know my conscience. And he's really asking them to be aware of this and to support him. He says in verse 12, this is your opportunity to defend me to them. 
so I don't have to defend myself. You might want to mark that. It's really, un it can be uncomfortable for ministers, and I can speak on a personal level about this, to have to defend myself. Not that I, I won't if I have to, but it's, it's, it's also, it's a blessing to have people who have been in our fellowship for a while, who, who've gotten to know us, know our heart, know our ministry, know me. So when someone says, well, he this or he that, they can immediately say, that's, that's not him. I'll never forget uh, a, a young lady that had said, uh, she said that Maria and I lived in a, and I'd never met her in my life, by the way, she was a high schooler, said, oh, Pastor David and Marie live in a three-story house and some luxury. And she was wrong. We, we live in a five-story house. No. No, she said, well, that pastor over there in Chino Valley, he's robbing the people and he's living in a three-story house. Things like that have been said so many times in various ways. But this young lady said that, and it was really a bummer to me that people were spreading that kind of garbage. But it was a blessing because, again, this was a long time ago. My son Joseph went to the prom and took this young lady and brought her to our house. And she saw that it's just a regular track home. And she in that, that quieted her down. We didn't have to defend ourselves. She just came over for pictures with Joseph. And she was able, and later on Joseph told us that she said, no, they don't live in some big mansion. They live in, in a nice home, in, but not a three-story luxury mansion. It's nice when you have people who think the best of you, isn't it? Isn't it nice to have people who think that you have integrity, who trust you? And isn't it a waste of time sometimes to have to defend yourself, to have to constantly say, I didn't do that, I didn't say that? Well, Paul is saying that. He said, I trust that in your consciences you know who we are. And, and, and I would rather have you defend me than for me to have to defend myself. In Proverbs 27, verse 2, it says, Let another man praise you, not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. Notice how he says in verse 12, uh, to those he says, who, who glory in appearance and not in heart. Now, some have an, an outward appearance of godliness, but inwardly, they're not right with God. Like the ancient Pharisees, they can have an outer appearance of holiness. But in reality, they hide their heart well. In 1 Timothy 5.24, Paul said, Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. There are some people that you look at them and you know, you know, just by what they're doing at that moment, and then this guy's sin is on the open. He's not hiding any of it. It's obvious. Whether you're standing in a street corner drinking or smoking dope or whatever, his sin is obvious. But there are others who dress their sins up nicely in suits. Sometimes they even get behind pulpits and they preach. They're hiding it well. Some men's sins go before them. They're obvious. And others follow after them. Not so obvious. But they're still sins nonetheless. And people have a tendency of looking only at the outside. And they can't see the heart. Man looks at the outer appearance. But God looks at the heart, we're told. And Paul was genuine. And what you saw in him was the grace of life. In verse 13, he says, if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are of a sound mind, it's for you. And then notice, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Now, I mentioned that throughout this letter, and I've said this from the beginning, and for those of you who are joining us, I'll share this with you now. Uh, Paul had been dealing in 2 Corinthians with a number of accusations that had been lodged against him by false teachers who are infiltrating the church and lodging accusations, charges. And up to this point, I've revealed to you, I've shown you 12 different charges. 
that he answers in this letter. This is the 13th charge that he deals with. And you know what the charge is? And I want you to see this with me. Notice how he says if we, if we are beside ourselves. What is the charge? That he's crazy. That he's nuts. That's the charge. Beside ourselves is another way of saying if we're crazy. In their sight, he was nuts. To some, my passion makes them think I'm crazy. But I can live with that. You see, this passion for Jesus drove him to preach throughout the known world. Don't you think, guys, don't you think that passion for Christ ought to drive you to share about him with people? Don't you think so? I know that it does in many of you. As I'm looking at you, I know that it does. I know that it does. I'm blessed. As I look out, I know so many of you are doing so much for Jesus, even right now. I'm looking at you, and I'm looking. I see your ministries right in front of me because that's what should drive us, right? Passion for Jesus Christ. That's what should drive us. Let me share a couple things with you guys. Um, I got this uh, yesterday and today. Let me just share with, with you something, you know, this lockdown, I'm calling it a lockdown. We're unable to meet and to assemble. It's driving me crazy. It's gotten to the point where I'm saying, how long, Lord? I miss my church. I, I, I miss my fellowship. I miss seeing people, even the little stinkers. I'm missing them too. I do. And I was reading today on, on Facebook, one of our young ladies Posted one of the most open-hearted, sweetest things I've read. Um, how she misses her church. And she started listing all of these things. And it just spoke to my heart. She said things, I miss the word with my pastor. I miss my sweet Marie who kisses me on the cheek. And she just went on and on and on. It was very touching. And this little girl was born and raised in this church. She's, she's not a baby. I mean, she's in her 30s, you know. And uh, as I was reading that, I was thinking, that is the most heartfelt, tender little thing that I've read in a long time. And I couldn't help but agree with her. I miss getting together with our church. I, I, miss, I miss laughing with our fellowship. I, I miss the opportunities of gathering. And, and I'm at that point where I'm asking the Lord, what is it that we should be doing? Because our governor, and I'm going to say it, somebody's going to get mad. God bless you. We'll see you later. Someone's going to get mad about it. But the bottom line is, as our governor, we need to pray for him because he doesn't have a love in his heart for Jesus Christ. So he doesn't have a value for what you and I value. Fellowship in the word of God and the spirit of God and worship of God. That's not his heart. So we're a non-essential. Churches gathering together, non-essential. It's okay for you to go to Costco and be bumping into people in Costco, standing in line to get something in a supermarket, that's okay. But it's, it's not okay. It's not okay for you to come and fellowship in church. Here, here in California, it really looks, and I, I, I speak on, uh, with, with a certain amount of, of, uh, of um, authority based on some information that I received that I out of respect for the one I asked. Uh, I don't want to give their name, but... It really looks as if we're in a position now that we can very soon begin to meet again. And I'm praying that we will. But we need to pray for our governor and, and those in charge. Because sometimes when you start having power, you start exercising in a way that doesn't take into consideration the things that need to be taken into consideration in the church. For many people, well, that's a non-essential gathering. It's more important to be able to go to a movie theater, a drive-in but you can't go to drive in church. See, it doesn't make any sense. But that said, in spite of those kinds of restrictions, we're still reaching people. Uh, we are reaching, and maybe more now, but as of yesterday, we are reaching 65 countries, including Qatar. Mexico is our number one foreign country viewer. We're using various media platforms. This week, just this week, 
we had 17,000 viewers on YouTube alone. We just went on Spotify. We have, in the last seven days, on YouTube, it, yeah, it appears this is YouTube, 266 new subscribers. Uh, we have various states like Indiana and Kansas, Texas, Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Nevada, New York, and others that are listening. Um, since we started using YouTube as one of our main streaming platforms on April 5th, we have had 26,465 views. Since 2010, when our channel started, we have had 1,378,000 views. 522,789 of which came in in the last year. The Lord is doing some things, guys, right now. We're reaching people that we wouldn't have reached. I, I, I got an email from somebody from... Uh, the Philippines, just yesterday, who said, I listen to you on the Philippine, in the Philippines. You know, the fact that we are also reaching into the United Arab Emirates, you know, in, in countries that are closed to the gospel. Once again, the word of God is not chained. We're reaching people right now in spite of the enemy wanting to undermine the gospel. He tried to close down Easter. <laughs> they tried that 2,000 years ago. They put a, a, a rock across a tomb and put a seal and put some guards. And they couldn't keep Jesus in there. And they still can't. The Lord is still moving. We're still getting people who are writing saying, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. I want to be followed up. Listen, I want to get back desperately. But I see what God is doing right now. And I'm blessed by that. And Paul was saying something of that effect. You see, this is a man who went throughout the whole world. He said, I determined to go and preach the name of Christ where his name had yet to be preached. That was his heart. He went out to do the work. And he said, the world thinks I'm crazy for what I do. But it's only because what I do has no value to them. They see it as useless. But he says, on the other hand, if I have a sound mind... It is that I might instruct you more accurately. Well, why do you do that, Paul? What is it that, that provoked you? Verse 14, the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Since Paul's conversion to faith in Jesus, his great compelling motive was the love of God. And it wasn't a love that originated and ended in Paul because he had been saved is because that kind of love can be self-interested. No, he had a love that came from God. And then this love internally motivated his love and his service to God. He not only loved God from a thankful heart, but he also had a love that was given to him by Jesus Christ. God's love for him came first. He loved God because God first loved him. You love God because he first loved you. As a father raising four children, there were times when one might say something like, you don't love me because I wasn't doing something for them that they wanted. You don't love me. And I've never, they've never been able to say that to me, ever. I don't like you, but I sure love you. That's a point where people would ordinarily have laughed anyway. There you go. No, I loved you. I loved you when you were in, you were in your mama's womb. I would put my mouth next to her little belly and I would yell at you when you were floating in the, in the womb in that amniotic fluid. And I'd put my mouth next to mama and I would yell, baby, I love you. I didn't know you were a little girl, little boy. I just knew you were mine. And when you climbed out of that womb when you were born and the doctor handed you to me, before he even handed you to mom, 
when he handed you to me and I turned and looked at my wife holding you, we had that moment where I would bring the baby and, and I would present our baby to mama. I shouldn't tell you these things. My heart starts going back to that moment. And I gave you to Mama. And Mama held you. And together we held you. And we loved you long before you even knew that you had a Mama or a Daddy. Long before. I loved you first. And then you loved me. And God loved me first. And then I loved him. That's how it works. We love him because he first loved us. And Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. Not my love alone for him. No, I'm a thankful sinner, grateful for forgiveness. No, I love him because he first loved me. And he put his love in me that I can now return to him. For God is love. Love doesn't originate in man. It originates in him. And it's the love of Christ that compelled him. Christ's love overwhelmed him. He was like John, the one whom Jesus loved. And when he thought of all he was and what he had done, how he had persecuted the church to the point of death. There's no sinner like a thankful sinner who's been forgiven. And so he went out with the word and it constrained him. It shut him in and it put him in the position of living selflessly for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't work for him to make him love us. We work in his name because he has loved us. And he's speaking of this compelling love. He had been a saved man, and he wants others saved. And so he speaks in this way in verse 14, the second portion. He says, if one died for all, all died. All were spiritually dead. All needed his sacrifice. All needed the life-giving power of his spirit. Paul said to the Ephesians, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And it says in verse 15, he died for all, even for those who ultimately would reject him. Jesus died for the sin of the whole world. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, it speaks of how God wants all men to be saved and to, to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as believers, we've received Jesus' offering of himself, and we've been forgiven. Like Paul said in Galatians 2, 20, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus died for us. We don't belong to ourselves any longer. He redeemed us. He bought us. We belong to him. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul said, You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And that's how you serve the Lord, and that's why you love him. We don't live for ourselves, as he says in verse 15, but we live for him who died for, for us and he rose again. Therefore, verse 16, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer. We don't know him that way any longer. Now, when he speaks concerning these things, the world uses outward appearance to make judgment, but that's not so for believers. We do not judge purely on outside standards. He's saying, I once judged Jesus by fleshly standards. I resisted him. I even persecuted his followers. Now, what's interesting, and I'll close with this. You might find this interesting. I do. He said, again, I'll read it, verse 16. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Listen, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Well, one, obviously, using fleshly standards, that's how he judged Christ. Now, that's an obvious thing. 
the unspiritual man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. So at one time, I used earthly standards or earth, earthly measurements once I knew him according to flesh. But there are commentators that give some insight into this that may have even a more practical kind of in a physical way, if you will. I mean, the spiritual is, is, is absolutely what we should, should, should aggressively believe. But there is a practical, and that is this. When you look at the time of Jesus and you look at the time of Paul, and you begin to think concerning the fact that they're contemporaries, that Paul and Jesus were alive at the same time, similar in age more than likely, it's very possible that Paul was aware of Jesus. Well, as a matter of fact, it's probable, was aware of Jesus while Jesus was doing his ministry. That he, Jesus was in Jerusalem a lot, and so was Paul. And Paul would have been acquainted. Everybody would have known what Jesus was doing. The, the word had gone out. He'd been doing what he had done for three years. People have heard of him. Paul, undoubtedly, as a rabbi, would have known who his enemy was. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And remember that the Pharisees had a hatred for Christ. Why would Paul not have known what his fellow Pharisees believed? Why would he have not known? They're alive at the same time. It isn't that Paul was somewhere in Asia, somewhere, somewhere in China or some other. No, he was there in the land. He would have been aware. He was at least locally able to know these things. And because much of Jesus' ministry was in Jerusalem during feasts, well, Paul could have been present also at the same time that Christ was. He was also a rabbinic student. And he would study the law in the city of Jerusalem. That's where he would have been. That's the center of learning. He had to have known of Jesus Christ. He spoke of himself in this way in Acts 22, verse 3. He said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. He would have known who Jesus is. He could very well have listened to him speak. And there he is with his rabbinic mind and his hatred for this man to the degree that when the word started going out that Jesus Christ was resurrected, he got permission to go and stop this insidious lie. I once judged him according to the flesh, but no longer. Isn't that interesting? Very probably true. Yes, I use a worldly standard to judge him. That's biblical, theological, solid. Practically, he could have an expression of that. I was aware of him, heard of his ministry, may have even seen his works or some of them. I have my rabbi friends. I rejected him completely. I judged him by outer appearance. As a natural man, I rejected him. But as a regenerated man, I no longer use fleshly standards of judgment. Perhaps there are some who see Jesus from fleshly standards of judgment. Oh, he was a teacher. He was a speaker. He was a revolutionary. An activist. Religious leader. Prophet. Healer. Miracle worker using a fleshly standard of judgment. Now, he's, he, are, he is those things, but he's more than those things. He's God in the flesh. And it takes the Holy Spirit to awaken you to that reality. He's God in the flesh. And if there are any right now who are listening to us who have not come to faith in Christ, and you are judging Jesus by fleshly standards. If you sense right now in your heart that what we just look through is true, that Jesus Christ is the answer, he is the Messiah, he is your Savior. And if you sense that, I want to pray with you right now. Let's close our eyes.
and we're going to pray. And if you know that Jesus Christ has spoken to you and you sense it right now, if you've been judging him according to your own fleshly standards, Paul used to. But Paul had his eyes opened up, and yours can be opened also. All you need to do is say, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Cleanse me, Lord. I turn from my sin. I hate it, and I need you. And you can be saved instantly. And if you desire him, let's pray together. Repeat after me in your heart. Father, I know that I am a sinner. Jesus died on the cross to save sinners. Jesus died to save me. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Give me a new life. I will follow you every day from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you can pray that with your heart, then you can be saved right now. I would only ask that you contact us so we can follow up, so we can share with you. Please let us know what you just did. Contact us so that we can connect with you, get you a Bible, and share with you a little bit more.